Hi everyone, I'm Megan, a bookseller at Literati Bookstore. I'm the host for tonight's event. Uh, this evening, we're pleased to welcome Amy Timberlake to our at home with Literati series in support of Egg Marks the Spot. She'll be in conversation with Betsy Bird. For attendees, the chat is closed, but I'll be dropping links to purchase Egg Marks the Spot from Literati throughout the event. You can also use the QA feature on your toolboard to submit questions at any time. A selection of them will be asked at the conclusion of the event. A reminder that you can shop for more books at literatibookstore.com for curbside pickup and shipping um, to your home anywhere in the United States, and that we are also open for in-person shopping. And now allow me to introduce tonight's author and moderator. Uh, Amy Timberlake's novels for young readers have received the Newbery Honor, Edgar Award, a Golden Kite Award, and the China Times Best Book Award. She grew up in Hudson, Wisconsin, but now calls Chicago home. She is a graduate of Mount Holyoke College and holds an MA in English and Creative Writing from the University of Illinois. You can find her walking on Chicago's late front ta- uh, trail on cool, crisp fall days. Betsy Bird is the collection development manager of Evanston Public Library, and the former youth material specialist of New York Public Library. She blogs frequently at the school library journal site, A Fuse Number Eight Production, and reviews for Kirkus and the New York Times on occasion. Betsy is the author of the picture books Giant Dance Party and the Great Santa Stakeout, and her upcoming debut middle grade novel, On Road to the Circus, illustrated by Kataka Award winning illustrator David Small. Um, Betsy hosts two podcasts, Story Seeds, which pairs kids and authors together to write stories, the very funny Few, A, and K, where she and her sister debate the relative merits of classic picture books. Without further ado, I will turn it over to Amy. Thank you so much. So, and yes, welcome everybody. And I am just so pleased to be in conversation with fellow Chicago area author, Amy Timberlake. And of course, if you have not read any of Amy's books, shame, shame, shame on you. (laughs) They are good. They are wonderful. Yes, uh, as that intro said, she's, she's won many, 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 many awards and most recently has been working on the Skunk and Badger books. The last one came out, I believe last year, is that correct, Amy? The last one, the most recent one came out on Wednesday. And then the most recent, right, the sequel. Ah, yes, the last one, yes. Right, yes. I was just trying to remember when the last one came out because I think it happened during the pandemic when time had no meaning and it got very- It's still 2020 to me. Yeah, of course, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's, it's, it never left. Exactly. It's just slowly dissolving. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Along with our brains. Uh, exactly. So Amy has uh, been kind enough uh, to say that she's going to do, we're going we're gonna to start off here with a little reading and she's going to read a little from her new book and explain what this heck, what the heck this book is. Amy, why don't you take it away? Okay, hi, thank you for having me at Literati. It's really exciting to be here. Okay, Um, so I'm gonna introduce these two books over here to you. Uh, The first, so there's two books. This is the first one, this is the second one. Um, The first, Skunk and Badger, introduces Skunk and Badger, and it is the story of a badger who does important rock work. And I'm gonna show you exactly how Badger does his important rock work. So this is an illustration by John Clausen, and there is Badger doing his important rock work. He did. He does his important rock work diligently every day. He loves it. He's always trying to focus, get even more into his important rock work. Focus, 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 he says. And then one day there's a knock at the door, rap, 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 rap. And it is this skunk right there and he's carrying his red suitcase and he just moves right in. And basically he is an unexpected roommate and unexpected roommates usually never go well. That's what I would say. And in in this case, it also does not go well. But spoiler, there's a book too. So apparently it works out. Um, But I would just like to say that these two characters are so different that at some point in my process, I literally thought that they would not get together and then I wouldn't really have a story. But that's, you know, so they're very different personalities, but they do come together. And so we have book two and book two comes from a section in book one. 
So if you have Skunk and Badger with you, please turn to page 54. Uh, and in this scene, Badger is showing Skunk his geological, geolog I think it's geological survey maps. And those are maps that show the rocks underneath the landscape, which Badger, of course, loves. Anyway, here's the little section that I'm going to read. Badger told Skunk how he used maps on his rock finding expedition. Expeditions. Skunk gasped. Rock finding expedition? What is that? Badger explained about how he camped out. Under the stars, interrupted Skunk. Technically, yes, but with a picnic every day, interrupted Skunk again. I guess. I do eat outside. <laughs> Skunk hopped from one foot to the other. What else? What else? So Skunk explained how clues in the landscape led to a particular rock. Skunk slapped his paw on the map. Like X marks the spot? Sort of. Yes. Then Skunk turned and said, Badger, what are we waiting for? Well, Skunk doesn't need to wait long because we have egg marks the spot. And of course, egg suggests that things probably go quite awry from X marks the spot. Something else happens in this story. But basically what happens is Badger needs to find a replacement for his spider egg, which has been taken by his cousin Fisher years and years ago. And he needs, it's like his letter A rock for his wall of rocks. So he needs to find one of those. And Skunk is a huge fan of the book review and he has this hedgehog that is taking his book review so he just wants to get out of there before another sunday goes by where he might not have his book review so the two of them leave they go off to campsite number five on endless lake and there starts an adventure you know it's secret well the way we wrote the blurb and the front of the book was secrets betrayals lies and and I'm not going to tell you what happens because I really tried hard to have some good twists in this. And I just want you to find them. <laughs> so just read it from beginning to beginning to end and see what you think. But I tried to make it sort of a fun, a really fun ride. Um, and that those are the two books. So there you go. Very cool. Can you is is there a part from the second book you can read it all? Or, or have well, you not selected it yet? It's so new. You well, have I have. Well, I like reading. I like reading about the gear. <laughs> <laughs> um, basically, as as the two characters are, if you, so I like, I like reading. Um, I actually sort of like reading. I like reading how Badger. <laughs> basically, as they're planning their camping trip, Badger is basically a gearhead. He loves his gear and he has specific criteria for his gear. And so I can read a small section of him choosing his gear. <laughs> so here we go. Um, on Thursday, Badger laid out everything he planned to take on the floor of his rock room and began paring down the weight of his load. If an item was needed, he would take it. Multiple uses would further reduce the number of items. Finally, he would whittle away the weight. No one needs the handle of a tooth on a toothbrush snap. Needed his go burrow tent with tent fly poles and stakes. Also needed his lava bed sleeping bag with orange interior and repeating volcano, volcano and lava field exterior. And he was taking the sleeping pad. Without a good night's sleep, what use would he be? Badger preferred objects made with titanium, strong and light, and silicone, light and squishy. He felt a genuine affection for aluminum, light, but thought it a risk. A shame, it is so fragile. The remaining items were interrogated. Prove your worth, Badger growled. Why are you necessary? How many tasks do you do? More than one, two, three? If the item passed, Badger dropped it on the scale and waited. Badger kept the bandana, napkin, potholder, hat, weight, 0 0.5 ounces. He considered the benefits of his X-34 Mighty Blaze flashlight. 
unnecessary, I can see in the dark, followed by, it only weighs two ounces, extra illumination is helpful. He decided to take the flashlight and leave his comb. What are claws for? Then Badger packed his heave-ho hauler backpack to see if everything fit. So there you go, that's gear advice, packing for a camping trip from Badger. That's what he would suggest. I just, I just love him snapping off the handle of the toothbrush, like extra weight. No, Woo! <laughs> like, throw it. Off it goes. <laughs> and, uh, and I think if you, if you inspect the cover, you can see that Skunk may not be quite as meticulous as Badger in his own. Oh yes, yes, yes. The the end pages. John has provided a bunch of things that Skunk has taken. Okay. Skunk is also oddly, I realized this later, but Skunk is also a planner just like Badger is. Unfortunately, he is planning for picnics every day, which means he is planning for a completely different kind of trip. I mean, I can't blame him. I love a good picnic. And <laughs> I, 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 can, I can see where the temptation would lie. Yeah, it makes yeah. sense. Yeah, it right. does. Did John let you know he was going to do that with the end papers, or was that just a delightful surprise that you found out later? Oh no, I I, I don't I don't find these things out. This was a surprise. <laughs> this was a surprise. Now, and did I you really know prior to getting the final book, or or it was it only oh, when you yeah. got the final book? Okay. Yeah, they did like just just it was very close to the final. They said, Amy, is there anything we need to know? about in the and there were a couple of items that I knew that they wouldn't take so I <laughs> we were able to we were able to change them into other items oh that's <laughs> fun no yeah it was kind of fun like for well for instance I, there is one this is a secret okay mm -hmm. so on this page you'll see a um Italian coffee pot right here mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's called a hot chocolate maker. And so because <laughs> I, I was like, I don't think they drink coffee ever. So so I was like, but, you know, just call them a hot chocolate maker. I am positive that skunk would see that device and go, oh, hot chocolate. This will work. That's that's what it do. Yeah, <laughs> Not hot chocolate. So I love yeah. that. So, but that would that wouldn't be something. By the way, that wouldn't be something that John would know necessarily. That they would never drink coffee. That's like, you you would just have to ask me, and somehow I might know. Yes. You know, I mean, sometimes I haven't quite gotten to that point where I I know if coffee is completely off the table. But I did know about that. I was oh, like, oh yeah, Very yeah. So he managed to just hit on that that thing you did know already. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, I know that you, like, so I've interviewed you before uh, with your skunk and your badger books, but some people may not know this question. So I'm going to do this and then we'll talk about the new book as well. But just where did the idea for these books come from? Uh, I, I was working on a different middle grade novel. It's doing some research for that book. And in doing the research, uh, I read all of the A.A. A. Milne Winnie the Pooh stories. And when I was reading those stories, I was really struck by how beautifully they were crafted, how the story arced in each little story. It really felt, I mean, I always, I always do this hand motion when I describe these stories, but they, they seem to start at one end and finished on the other end. And it was just a beautiful like following a heart <laughs> yeah it was just they were they were beautiful and they're a little a little bit philosophical I guess I just I just loved the whole thing and it was interesting because I I hadn't necessarily been a huge Winnie the Pooh fan earlier in my life but it was just coming to it in this context and I read them all and I was very impressed so I started because I was stuck on this other book, basically, <laughs> I started thinking about what it would be like if I wrote a story in the style, I guess it would be more in the style of those 
stories. So they were written, I don't know, 19, I should know this by now, but because I've told this enough, but I think it was like, I want to say 1950s, <laughs> I want to say. So I, anyway, so I was thinking about that. I was thinking about my sense of humor and my style of writing. And I wondered what kind of stories I would create if I, if I had animals. Now, this is what I call this now, animals and sweaters this genre that John has, I'm, I'm naming after John's illustration, Animals and Sweaters. Sweaters on book number two are so good on that cover, man. I love those sweaters. I, like a fair I, isle sweater going on there. Some cable knit. One, one cable, one mm -hmm. big, I mean, definitely, definitely a sweater a guy would wear yeah, too. I mean. Fisherman would slip right into that thing. It's perfect. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So so I was thinking about that and I was, anyway, so, so that's basically what happened is I gave myself a writing challenge. I didn't necessarily think that there was a market for the books. I really didn't. I just, I was giving myself a challenge to see what would happen if I did it. And then I wrote two chapters, sent it to my agent. He liked it. I said, are you sure you like it? Cause it will take me a while to do it. And I won't write that middle grade that we all know we would like you to write. <laughs> he said, yes, I like that. I like this. So I was like, okay. So I, I spent the time, I wrote it. Um, so I spent a year at least. I wrote it, sent it back to him. And it was, it was pretty highly polished because I, as I said, I didn't know if there was a market for it. So I wanted to make sure that the manuscript was good enough that you could know what I was trying to do. <laughs> that's like when I'm like look I have one chance to do this if this isn't your thing I want you I want to know it hmm. so I sent it to him and he he actually really liked it and and then that was at the point where he said you know what do you think about John and I said well wow yes John yes <laughs> And um, anyone said, not John. <laughs> you know, and also, look, he does these funny, his eyes are just, they're so expressive. His so I was just like, I know. No, and, I, 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 and for the first yes. time ever on the first book, he had an animal smiling, which, oh my gosh, done, yeah, you undo smiles. That's not a he thing doesn't? with John, so. <laughs> oh, I, I remember you saying that. And I wonder. Look at any book by John Classen. And that There's is teeth. It's a grin. It's, and a, grin. Teeth. a grin. It's so oh. rare. It's it's like your book, and that's it. <laughs> so anyway, he does a grin really well, I yeah. would like to say. Yeah. I would so, love to say. <laughs> so anyway he sent it to John 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 looked at it and then he came back eventually and said I want to do I want to do something in a, a classic style he had he sh he had pictures of an old wind in the willows edition that's what he wanted he was thinking so and basically part of what he meant by that was these beautiful full color plates that are in the book. I mean, they're kind of an extra step for the publisher. There's there's nothing on this side. And it just means that the they have to actually slip it into the book. So it's like this extra thing, but that's what John wanted to do. And so anyway, how, they asked how I felt about that. I was like, yay, that sounds fabulous. And so Steve put us together and then sort of sold us as a pair. That's cool. And now, of course, I really want to see the John Class and Wind of the Willows version because you know he's got yeah. it in him somewhere. Oh, yeah. No, no. Yeah, totally. Totally. Probably. Yeah. Good job. That's very English. But yeah. So it's funny you were saying that you didn't know who the market would be for these books. I know for a fact that I know exactly one of the markets and there's a bunch of different ones. But one, I can tell you right now, um, both my kids' teachers, both the fifth grader and the second grader, have teachers reading them the one and only Ivan, which is a great uh. book and I love it very much. But let me tell you, there's more than just Ivan out there. There's more than Charlotte's Web. And your book 
fits in perfectly because parent teachers love animal books to read aloud to classes. So oh, what kind of reception did the first book get when it came out? Like, like who, who read it? Uh, what kind of response did you get? Well, by the way, I, I really would love to hear what you're thinking the market is for this book. Just, I mean, I think I would love to hear that. I, so can we just save a little time? So sure, you're we're going to put a little pin in that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Nope. Um, no, the reception's been really great. I, um, it's, people are starting to refer to it as a read aloud, which is great because I, I didn't actually think that was a, <laughs> I didn't think that was a thing. So I'm, I'm happy that that's happening. And it seems like uh, it is being used in classrooms and read aloud. It's also, uh, it's also, it's gotten a very strong reception with uh, bookstores, independent bookstores in particular. That's been the other area. It seems like it seems like they they know who to sell it to. Yeah. You know, they're hand selling it. Mm hmm. Yeah. So what do you think? I mean, when you. I mean, I, I you're saying right there. So it's a hand sellable book. First of all, it's a beautiful object. Um, yeah, it is. It's beautiful. It's thick. It, the cover feels good. People never really go into the tactile nature of a physical cover. Some of them feel icky. I'm not going to lie to you. Some of them you feel me like, I don't want to hold this. I'm going to take the, cover, the jacket off. Now, the jacket feels good, but the pages are thick. I believe it's beveled edge. Am I remembering this correctly? It's a beveled edge on that book? Uh, oh. it, no, it's it's pretty. It looks like it. I mean, it's not like the ragged paper edge. It's not the ragged paper, but it's, yeah. And then it's, uh, and it's got those, yeah, those John Classen, first John Classen name, first John Classen art. So it's exactly. got that kind of classic feel to it. Um, the writing definitely invokes uh, Pooh, uh, who you know you were you were influenced by on some level. So yeah, yeah, I'm totally. That you've got a couple different markets here. You got first of all the teacher one, which I just mentioned for the read aloud yeah. classes. You've got the gift market because someone walks in, you know, you get like that aunt or uncle who, who has a new niece or nephew. They literally have no idea what children's books exist outside of you know, cat in the hat from when they were kids. And good night moon. And good night moon and Harry Potter. Like that's where it ends. Like it's either good night moon or it's Harry Potter. It can't be both. So they walk in with that dazed kind of look into the bookstore. And if it's a smart bookseller, they can zero right in and be like, I know what I will get you. And uh, yeah, and this book is perfect for hand selling to, to aunts and uncles. It is also very good uh, for grandparents. Oh my gosh, it's perfect for grandparents. I mean, grandparent walks in, they're just, they're gonna grab that book and they're, I mean, they're just not gonna let go of it. It's ideal. <laughs> so, and then kids, okay. all right, kids, yeah. that part too. But yes, kids, kids who like animal stories, they exist. Um, they don't, I mean, <laughs> they were sort of marketed to so directly with those Aaron Hunter books, you know, Into the Wild and all the, the warriors, you know, the cats and the oh, yeah, 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 yeah. polar bears and how about gorillas and yeah, so <laughs> it's uh, but sometimes they just want a good story um, yeah. with an animal in a fair owl sweater, so. There you go all right yeah. yeah, so so it's been pretty fun, I mean it's been, it's been pretty fun yeah, well so, oh, I do have to ask this too, though, it's sort of along the same lines. Um, no doubt you've gotten like letters from kids and they write to you and they talk to you about the book. Surely you've had kids write to you being like, I know exactly what your sequel should be about. Have you gotten the sequel suggestions from the kids? I haven't actually. Oh, I, good. I, okay, so you didn't. No, good, I always worry about that. Yeah, because you no, know, I, I actually, I, I don't think, I don't think I've actually had a lot of contact with kids yet. Mm -hmm. Just to be honest, because well, it I has been a COVID pandemic. So. Yeah, it's it's. I, I think really it's, feel like it's, it. Yeah, it's totally it's totally pandemic related. I because. The first book came out September 2020, and all the events are have been virtual, 
which means I definitely see all the little rectangles on the school. I've been at, to school visits. I've seen hundreds and hundreds of little tiny yeah. kids in rectangles. And actually last year they were, they were all in their own little homes. Mm. So there was like just literally one kid in each square or rectangle. Yeah. And this year, this year there are whole classrooms in that tiny rectangle. So, I mean, I'm, is there that are you there, like a I, projected huge head on a whiteboard or something like that? Like, I, 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 I do not ask. I, this is not what I want to know. <laughs> Like, I do not want to know. Do not tell, tell me. how the magic works. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, seriously. I, I'm at home. I am the person that tries to take the photos mm -hmm. because I prefer to be behind the camera. This is not my natural habitat yeah, yeah. here with the lights and the... <laughs> um, <laughs> so actually, so I just haven't had that much contact with kids to really know how they're responding. In fact, I, I just had my first in-person book signing. Algonquin is not necessarily sending anyone out right now, but there was a bookstore in Evanston booked, who, which you Yay! probably know. And they, anyway, with two days notice, they did a book signing. So I met my first kids and it was a hoot. A book, I, a book that's good kids too. Yeah. They like, were, they, Oh, really? They've got a middle grade, like, you know, reading club, and it's packed with children. I mean, just tons of readers. I, I, I don't know how they do it, because the one thing anyone knows in a library or a bookstore, if you make a reading club and then you get like three kids, they get tons of kids. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, yeah. it was it, it was great. It was great. And so I got to meet the parents that were reading the book to kids. And I was, and the kids that were reading it themselves and the, the older people that were just enjoying it. So that was, it was a pretty crazy range. I mean, there was a four-year-old that yelled at me, which oh, I wow. thought was really hilarious. He really liked, he really likes these books and his dad is reading them to him. He's, he's four. So he was quite small, but they took the second book with them. And as they were leaving, I said, oh, I hope you enjoy the book. And he turned around. He was holding his dad's hand. He turned around and he said, I will. Like that. <laughs> I was like, okay, sorry. This I you vow. Know, I don't, I didn't want to even inject any, any fear that you might not enjoy this book. I know you're going to enjoy it. Okay, good. Good. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Doubt me not, author. <laughs> <laughs> this book shall I be enjoyed will. to the fullest. <laughs> that was fantastic. So if the if the kids weren't giving you sequel ideas, then you had to come up with your own sequel ideas. So how did I mean asking this question like where do you get your ideas? Like that's not what I'm saying, um, but it is what I'm saying because uh, sequels are different. You've already established so many of the things that go into a novel, you know, character and, and, and just the world building in itself. The world building's done. We know who the characters are. So now you've got to make a sequel. So mm -hmm. uh, did you know when you wrote the first one where the second one would go? Or did you not even know until you were writing the second one where it would go? Uh, well, I, I, I did, I, there's definitely a, an element of me not knowing what's going to happen, mm -hmm. but there were certain things that I knew like that, that, that line that I read you from the first book, mm -hmm. I knew, well, I mean, obviously they have to go on a rock finding expedition, but you know, the maps have been brought out. This is, this cannot be uncharted. So they, I knew that that was going to happen. I also knew that when I was thinking about the series that I wanted to at least have the first three or the first three to take part in different seasons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that helps mm -hmm. you kind of have spring, summer, and then the third book will be in winter. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that helps. And then I also knew that the challenge for myself was that I wanted to explore different genres, which each book, just for the fun of it. Mm -hmm. 
So this book, uh, it, that makes it sound like the books don't go together. So I want to say they do really go together. <laughs> but the first book is kind of a buddy genre, mm -hmm. is a buddy genre. So like the, think if you're thinking movies, it would be The Odd Couple. Mm -hmm. And this one is in the kind of in the treasure hunt genre. So if you're thinking movies, think Indiana Jones. Nice. Think, um, but it also has a camping thing going on. So you, it's kind of a camping morphed into, <laughs> into <laughs> more of a treasure hunt. Right. So there's that. And then, and then it's interesting. One of the interesting things is that you start to have characters that I, I there were some characters that I did not foresee that people really liked in the first book that I realized, oh my gosh, now I have to always make sure I touch this character. So this book has a chick, has chickens. So I knew obviously that chickens are part of this one. I, but in this book, a single chicken becomes more of the main character. So it's just slightly different, but I'm thinking about that. I'm thinking, and then Rocket Potato, for instance, Rocket Potato is apparently a lot of people's favorite. I don't know, really? a That's potato, great. a potato has now has a <laughs> fan base. So, I mean, I am never getting rid of rocket potato. <laughs> you can't. Eventually, it turns into a rock anyway. So, yeah. Well, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, lifespan on a potato is not yeah, that long. I mean, mushy, don't they? Yeah. well, they're, you know, they once they once they go through their life cycle, ba basically rocket potato has baby potatoes. Right. Right. So. So anyway, I. All right. So rocket potatoes in here. We touch on rocket potato in this. And I am continuing to think about what happens to rocket potato in the third book because i mean obviously rocket potato is part of the family now right makes sense yeah so there you go yeah um, and now, now i'm thinking like in terms of like your next book in the winter and i'm like oh what if there'll be any estivation you know when it's not hibernate hibernation it's when they slightly hibernate when it's estivation like hmm like no i'm not even gonna think about that um <laughs> i you know and you've you've kind of like stumbled into one of the questions that I was uh, going to bring up. Are the chickens in the next book? Oh, of course. Of course. They're, they're like a main, they're main, they're main characters. There's always got to be chickens. Yeah. They're, yeah. But it's, I mean, this is into the woods. So kind of want to, you know, kind of want to have more of the community, you know, do you know what I mean? So you're just yeah. kind of always like sort of feeling through the balances and then you have what's, what's the next genre going to be mm -hmm. and what, you know, what am I going to do? Yeah. So. Yeah. Good question. <laughs> so you do introduce new characters though, because I know there is a character called Fisher. You were yes. very good at finding small predatory mammals <laughs> in different ways. I don't know much about, they're called fishers, right? Hey, is it right on the, on Oh my the, gosh, yeah, there he goes. He looks like a weasel. Yeah, he is a weasel. Yeah. He's part of the weasel family. So a fisher which is, is part of the weasel family. Okay. Just like the stoat is part of yeah. Badger's weasel family. He has many interesting cousins. He does. <laughs> in his I family. I do love that they're all cousins, which is fantastic, yeah. I like I like that element to it but yeah no it's funny like I love learning about new furry predatory animals every time I read one of your books so well now, it's, a, it's it is a weird thing trying to figure out how all right well anyway the whole the whole uh some animals eat other animals and I have a world and it's you know you got to think about these things and you know, skunk eats eggs, but the chickens are okay with that. Uh, you know, I, I don't know how it all works out, but it's sort of, it I sort think of it works down out. To, is the thing <laughs> talking to you at some point and then you eat it? Like that makes a difference, I think. Cause an egg can't talk, but a chicken yeah. can, well, it's a big, I mean, they talk like chickens, but they do apparently yeah. talk uh, in their own way. And then, so if you're talking to, but I don't know, maybe it all comes down to whether or not you can make out what they're saying. Huh? If you can't, they're fair game. 
but if you can't. <laughs> I'm just it's a, it's, all the rules now for your book here. Yeah. Here well, we it is. It is. It is an interesting. It's an interesting conundrum. I and I. I kind of think. Well, if you think about us, I guess you know we're all. Many of us, I shall say, many of us are omnivores of some sort. Mm -hmm. And if we were actually, you know, having conversations with the cows that we were, it would be more difficult to have that burger. That I occasionally have. You might appreciate that burger more because you know its name. <laughs> exactly. So there yeah. you go. That's why some people say never name your chickens. You're going to eat. Oh them. yes, yes. But then it's true. it doesn't work. Um, it's funny when you were talking about you were surprised that the book became a read aloud because one of the things I like so much about the first Skunk and Badger uh, was its audiobook, and which I truly. And I do honestly mean this. I tru truly believe it was the best audiobook of 2020. And I don't care who hears me. It was brilliant. As I recall the actor was Michael Boatman. Um, yes. The reading. Uh, will he be back? Do you know? For Egg Marks the Spot. Oh, he is. He's done it. And he liked it. He had a good time. So I actually. He really had a good time. Yeah. I heard that he had a great time. So I'm. I, I think it's probably I haven't listened to it yet, but I Those think it would be yeah. I think it would be worth it. I think yeah. it would be worth it, especially because especially because we have uh, Fisher in this. And Ooh, I just yeah. think I just think he's going to go nuts. Yeah. For Fisher. Because, did, yeah. you know, he does some good baddies. Uh, yeah, that's what I think. I think it's just so I think it's going to be really good. Um, I just I just haven't listened to it because. Well, it's partly it's partly because it's my own writing and it's just it's a bit weird, like for me. No, I completely understand that. It's basically someone is saying words that came from your brain. So your yeah. thoughts are being said through another person's mouth. And there's nothing not weird about that. Yeah. It's downright bizarre. I can't I can't yeah. listen to anyone's I've got audiobooks of my books. I've never listen to them I don't know that I will um because uh, you know best case scenario I think they do a brilliant job more likely scenario I'll be like that word is not pronounced that you don't put the emphasis on the syllable there and it's supposed to be in a different way <laughs> so yeah. well and everybody everybody I've learned this that everybody does skunk in a completely different way oh I bet now that's interesting yes no I think it would be really fun to have an audio clip of different people doing their skunk and badgers because there was a bookseller a couple nights ago that said he did his skunk imitation and he said how close am i and oh and then he said and i think badger is lower a lower voice and i went yeah i always think of badger having a lower voice and then he said i was completely off on skunk wasn't i and i was like well yeah i would never do it like that so but then there was there was another person who said because he doesn't because skunk doesn't use contractions, and this huh. is the writer's name Damon Runyon, mm -hmm. does New York kind of you can read skunk, in that voice and he did it, and it was hilarious and it kind of got stuck in my head and I was like oh that has to go I can't be thinking like that but it really you can do it. That actually was my follow-up question if you had listened to the Boatman, but now I can use it with the David Runyon. Uh, <laughs> when you hear someone do a character of your own in their own yeah. voice, is, is there a danger of when you are then writing the character, you hear that voice for the character from there on in? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Sure. I mean, yeah, I because I just love David yeah Ray. I'm kind of I'm kind of I'm a little bit spongy in terms of what I'm reading when I'm writing so I sort of have to avoid sometimes I have to avoid people that have really strong voices otherwise I'll start you know I don't know doing a bad imitation of Isabella Lende <laughs> or you know, you're like no 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 we do not need to hear Amy's bad imitation. <laughs> I don't know. I got one here, but no, <laughs> I'll spare you. Um, so here's a question for, you. for this next book. Was there anything that you wanted to include that you just couldn't? 
it just didn't go in. It didn't fit or it got cut or it was too much or was it? Oh, just, yeah. Yeah. Like, was there anything? What, what was it? Well, I, they, a skunk has his first experience of the woods. He's, um, he's a city skunk. He's never been in the woods before. And so the woodland animals, I actually had several woodland animals. Um, he experienced a, a herd of deer for the first time. He awoke with uh, deer all around him. It was, I thought it was pretty funny. It just, you know, the scene just needed to keep moving. <laughs> so away went all that work. Oof. And then uh, there was a, there were some, there were some other little animal creatures that came in. I don't even think, I don't even think that, uh, that Elise ever saw any of this. I don't think she ever saw the deer scene. I don't think she ever saw the um, what were they? Oh, they were marmots. I had a whole family of marmots had come in and uh, and basically I think skunk feeds um, pretzels and the youngest one uses the pretzels as glasses, but it, there's a reason why they come in. And anyway, I, I don't want to say too much more because it, it adds to, there's a joke that, that they sort of were part of. And I thought it was great. And I was, but eventually you read it, I read it and, and Phil read it and he was like, oh, things just got to keep moving. Cut, you know, and that's just, that's just the process with these is you just write a lot and then you go, okay, what's the, what's the best little bits that, that I came up with. Um, and yeah, and then you and then and then you try to just con compress, compress, condense, condense, and then see what you have to just keep it keep it moving. Yeah, no, I understand that. It, my husband's a screenwriter, and there's a term that they use where it's like it comes right out. <laughs> it's like <laughs> when that when there's something in that book and it really doesn't need to be there, it comes right out. And I think of that yeah all the time when it comes to my writing, like oh that thing that I really liked. It comes um, right out. <laughs> it's painful. It's definitely painful. But you're like, well, I mean, when you have a better thing, you feel like, oh, that was worth it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I should make a quick announcement to the people who are watching. If any of you have any questions for Amy, I am more than happy to uh, read them out. You can you can write them. Uh, I don't know. You can write them in the chat or the q and I'm not sure which. I'll monitor them both. But uh, in lieu of that, I have many more questions myself. So you did say that um, you did not read Winnie the Pooh when you were a kid. I didn't either. Um, I just well, I, think I, I think I think they might have I think they might have read it to me. It just didn't it just didn't stick with me as much. It's a strange little book. Yeah, it's it's hard to know when to read them to a kid. I think more than anything. Yeah. Yeah. But what did you read as a kid? What were your what were your influences? What what did you like? Well, I I had a library card pretty young, mm -hmm. and it was my favorite thing. There was a library at the bottom of the hill, so I walked. I this was during the time when you know a kid could walk like ten blocks by themselves, go to the library, pick up their books, and walk home. Mm -hmm. So I walked down the hill. 10 blocks down the hill. Then I walked back up the hill with my books. I just remember that because they were heavy. So, mm -hmm. but um, I read, like, I loved James Thurber, Many Moons. Mm -hmm. I loved the Dr. Seuss. I loved, Sh you know, all the classics like Shel Silverstein. I, I basically read anything that looked interesting in the kids section. I mean, seriously, I think the librarian would just give me things and then I'd bring them home and I'd read them and I'd come back. And then I remember, <laughs> I remember also, I read Agatha Christie pretty young. Um, I, I, and I just think that was, that was partly because the, the way the library, it was one of those old Rockefeller libraries and the kids section was downstairs. And my parents always said, well, the sections for adults are upstairs. So I just assumed I was not supposed to be up there. Mm -hmm. And so that just lent all this mystery. 
So as soon as I found, I went upstairs and I think the first Agatha Christie I ever read was Elephants. There's one called like Elephants Never Forget or something, something like that. And I thought it was about elephants. I remember (laughs) I read the whole book like going, but where is the elephant? (laughs) (laughs) And it was so scary to me. It was really scary to me that I literally, I did the whole thing with the flashlight. I waited until my parents had put me to bed. And then I like whizzed the covers over my head because I was, I had, I had certain things I was afraid of in the, about the dark. So I would cover my, and then I just have the flashlight and I just read that book and I stayed up almost all night to read it because it was scary. Mm -hmm. And I was still waiting for the elephant. (laughs) And then, but I got I got Curse hooked on Agatha Christie. Agatha. <laughs> I got hooked on Agatha Christie at that point. I actually liked the suspense a lot. Um, so then I started reading Agatha Christie, Nancy Drew. Um, I read those all in order, exactly in order, in a crazy like I'm reading number fifty two. I cannot read anything but number fifty three. Oh my god. It's not available at this time. What are you going to do? Yeah. Kids are like that yeah. now. Yeah, they have to read them in order and they cannot skip. Yeah. Yeah. Even though it was Nancy, annoying. literally you can just go anywhere with Nancy. It's the plot doesn't change that much. No, there's only one sentence in that whole story that says, and next time she's going to have the secret of the old clock. Mm-hmm. And I was like, Well, I have to know about the secret of the old clock. And I just mm-hmm. thought. Oh my gosh. And yeah, nothing ever happens with Ned Nickerson either. No, it's not like, like Nancy suddenly acquires like an adorable sibling at some point. Like, no, it's, <laughs> it's pretty, the cast is pretty sick. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's a reliability to it, Nancy. And I have yeah, to, I, I'm very happy you said Agatha Christie at a young age because um, I don't know if anyone remembers this, but Scholastic Book Fairs used to sell Agatha Christie mysteries uh, in Oh, Elementary. really? Yeah. That's how I read Murder on the Orient Express was I saw it and I was like, this doesn't look like a kid's book. I will read this. And like, Ooh, people are dying all over the place. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. So can we expect a book number three? Yes. Good. Yes, there will be a book number three. It's under contract. It will not appear next year, but it's coming. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's fine. You know how many you want to do all together? I mean, you said seasons. Would, would there be four all together? Or, or would you like to go beyond that? Or? Well, no, I, I think I think uh, I I wouldn't mind, I think, writing another one. I do. I do need to I do need to just give myself a break to think about it. But I, I have an idea for a fourth one for sure. Uh, it's just I think it just depends on how well it does. You know, I mean, the, the contract is for three. Mm-hmm. and I think we're all just going to see how it goes, and I don't know, and then after that, I, I mean, I kind of hope so. They're really fun to write. They're, it's yeah. a happy world to be in. Mm-hmm. I enjoy it. I like, I like, I like the sense of playing. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm really playing publicly, which is an odd feeling, but, <laughs> but it's fun to do it, um, and now that I've done it, I'm more comfortable with it. It was, it felt kind of vulnerable at first, <laughs> sort of embarrassing. And then I was like, well, now I'm out there. Now I'm really out there. Now I'm having a good time. So I might as well keep doing it. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. All right. Well, and you mentioned um, before, you know, there was a middle grade you were supposed to be writing. What else are you working on? Or is it just Skunk it's and Badger? Mm-hmm. it's just these it's just these okay all right Good yeah I mean they're also just they're just right now they're just great to write I um yeah I the other book it's not that it's completely out of the question but I I would really like to rework it in a lot of different ways I, there was there were certain things that I was really having trouble with I I was trying to write it's funny that these are male characters because the other book I was trying to write adolescent boys and I totally, wow, was, I I just never felt comfortable with it. 
-hmm. And I think for me, I just really have to reach that space where I go, yes, that is what the character would feel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But with adolescent boys, like right at like 12, 13, whew, I, I was like, I, I do not know. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, there was a part that I really did not know. Now, I don't feel like I would have trouble writing a grown man <laughs> or, a, or a younger well, male you got it. character. In, in these and here's, books. these are essentially grown exact critters, but they're grown. <laughs> yeah, they so jobs, sort of. Yeah, they they <laughs> they are. They're kind of grown ups in animal. Yeah. There you go. Well, that's, yeah. you know, that's what we've always said at the library is that you can only get away usually with writing about grown-ups to children if they're furry in a, in a novel, if they're furry animals. So red wall, you know, like all these things where it's an animal, but it has taxes. <laughs> so that's exactly. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Cause that's, okay. yeah. we can deal with that, but we can't deal with adults doing adult things in novels that's just no good so yeah that's an interesting that is an interesting thing i'm not sure i i'm, I'm not i'm not very positive. rare exceptions but they are rare yeah you like usually... what what are the books that work that have adults in them for kids there was uh, i've only really <laughs> sorry ever to... one um yeah and it was called montmorency it was about a gentleman yeah. thief um came out like gosh must be like 15 years ago or something like that that book was great um but i like i say very rare it's usually a child protagonist or a fuzzy little critter with a sweater yeah i'm writing this down down there (laughs) yeah in case you're wondering i have a piece of paper over here so i'm just (laughs) i realized People can't see what I'm doing, but I'm actually I'm actually writing your I'm making notes. <laughs> I don't get to talk to Betsy Bird every day. Come on, you know I get to find these things out. We're gonna brainstorm now. The rest of you guys can leave. We're just gonna talk <laughs> books. It's good. I like it. That's good stuff. Well, uh, what are some of the other places? I don't know if you can off the top of your head come up with this, but what are the other places people can can see you, or do you have anything coming up like appearance wise and other places? Uh, yeah, next tomorrow, there's yeah. going to be, uh, or, I think tomorrow is, tomorrow night is the book stall with James Cleese. Mm-hmm. And oh, no, tomorrow night is Gibson's bookstore with Kate Hannigan. And oh, then James, Kate. James Cleese at the book stall. And if you want to catch John, uh, he's going to join me this week at politics and prose Aww. on Thursday or Friday but if you go to my website amytimberlake.com and hit events you can see the whole list and and see what you would like there's going to be one with Adam Rex too which would be really fun I because we haven't you know we haven't done anything together but he was the first he was the first oh, illustrator yeah. of 30 Cowboy. this book I remember that. Yeah, so, and he is wonderful. So that'll be really fun. I'm looking forward to it. But of course, people can buy a book here at Literati Bookstore. And have you yes. So it looks like we've reached the top of the hour. Thank you so much to Amy and Betsy for joining us on At Home with Literati. A reminder to buy Egg Mark as a spot. The link is in the chat. Um, and take care, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you. Yes, buy it from Literati. <laughs> Okay. <laughs>